answer. Uh, how old are you? You're young. And you you just been told you have cancer. Anybody say, how nifty, I have cancer. That makes my day. <coughs> no? That's bad news. Yes? And what will you be tempted to do? Immediately go on a self-pity party. That's what you're all, we're all tempted to do. Start theorizing. You know, you'll start thinking, why me, why this, why now? What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen? Can you imagine the future? Does this mean I can't get married? Does this mean I'm going to die soon? And, and you're, you're doing the wrong focus, wrong focus. But there's nothing else you're going to be able to do unless you learn something else to do. <clears throat> and how are you going to learn some other response? It's called trying to memorize what I'm teaching you here. Now, do you want God's will for your life? Do you? Do you know what God's will is? But do you know what his ultimate purpose for your life is? Mm -hmm. What is it? Christ-like development. And as does he owe you 70 years plus? Yes or no? He owes you nothing. Does he have a right to let you get cancer? Yes. Do you want to have cancer? No. Is it scary? Absolutely. What are you going to do to not be all bummed out and depressed and stressed out? You're going to have to control what goes on up here or it will control you. Yes or no? Yes. And if you don't know how to have the wrong focus, which all of us have immediately, all your friends will help you have the wrong focus. <laughs> They'll all come. And they'll question out loud, I wonder why God let this happen to you. And they'll try to push your mind. They won't say, no, I wonder what God is wanting to teach you in this situation. That sounds so cruel. Sounds like you had to get cancer so you could learn. So I don't go around saying this either. <laughs> I say, oh, bummer, so sorry. Wow, pray for you. Because it's not a wisdom literature time. This is a wisdom literature time where we formalize teaching on these areas. It's not how to learn bedroom, sick room counseling class. This is not that. You're either going to get these things and start working on them now or not. And it will never be easier for the rest of your life than now, when we're doing it together. And it's a normal routine. So either give it the best you got and pray over it and ask God to help you to get this in here instead of saying, bummer, wow, wow, a flat tire, oh, man. All that kind of reason. What kind of response is that? Normal, worldly response. Everybody does it some way or the other. They're bummed out. Quit being pressed into the world's mold. You said them done, so I've got to quote Psalm 34 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. So quit it. Yes, it's irritating. Yes, it's you're on a deadline. Yes, you're going to be late. Yes, it's cold. No, you didn't want a flat. Why rehearse that? That's all self true. You, does it make you feel better to say what you already know is true? Say what God wants you to say. I've got to do that regularly. I don't personalize my oldest brother's death. Called him. Couldn't even understand one out of 20 words because of the medicine he's on. I called Wayne. I said, man, David's really bad. Shit. Yeah, he, they say that every day he is visibly worse. Now, tell me. If I visualize, that's my oldest brother. If I visualize that and personalize it, what's it going to be like if that was me? What would that do to my emotions? 
Huh? It would bum me out, depending on how vivid my imagination is. I could go into trauma. I could cry. I could want to huddle up in a fetal position and say, oh, God, don't let it happen to me. All kinds of responses, right? So I'm talking about my brother, not your brother, because it would sound harsh for me to teach you wisdom about your family and your trauma and your problems. So I want to talk this stuff to you when you're in trauma. I want to talk it to you now. And you either learn it or not. Me, I'm doing my best to deepen in this truth. <coughs> Point out everybody to die. God doesn't know my brother. He, he, 75, he's 75. You know, he said, oh, dude, that's plenty long. Yeah, wait till you're 75. Isn't that plenty long? Drop dead then, huh? Yeah, you don't want anybody. You get up to be 75, you're in good health. That, that doesn't seem that old, according to the 74 years old and 73 year olds I talked to. Doesn't quite seem so bad. It sounds as old as dirt to me. I'm 68. 75 is not far off. But I, I don't feel 68. I think that's ghastly. You want to be 68? No, I don't either. <laughs> but the only way I know not to be it is drop dead, you know, but it's too late. I can't be 60. I drop dead, I can't be 69. You know, it, it happens if you keep breathing and living. You understand what I'm saying? Now, the, the question is this. Is he in God's hands? He is. Am I sad and sorry that this has happened? Of course. Should I be bummed out? Only if Jesus is not the center of my joy. Only if rejoice always and everything give thanks isn't true. Is there a time to mourn? Yes. Is it all day long, every day, until he dies? No. So you know one of the big challenges of your life, student? Figuring out how to handle things properly and what is the proper time to do things. There's a time to marry. I wanted to, I was looking forward to marriage ever since I started high school. I told my mom, as soon as I'm out of high school I'm gonna get married. I wouldn't mind getting married in high school. My mom never said, well honey that's stupid or anything. She said, well sweetheart, let's think about it. Getting married, you can't live here anymore. So you have to have rent an apartment. Let's look in the newspaper, see what rent's going for. Now, what, what section of town do you want to live in? Oh, it's more expensive living there. And you'll have to have a car. To, you'll have to have a job. And we, we, she made out a list with me. And I looked at it. Man, I'll never be able to get married. She said, well, it's a big decision. So I postponed it from my freshman year. My sophomore year. My junior year. And my senior year. Then, I wanted to get married. And my mom said, well, if you don't have a college education, you'll we'll have to have a job that doesn't require my You can be a, a uh, construction worker like your daddy. Why don't you go work with him this summer? So I went. It was like drywall. I worked that summer and decided I want to go to college. I, want to go to college. I didn't find my life fulfillment sweating, <laughs> doing the same thing over and over and over and over and trying to do it faster and trying to break your little record. How many can you hang today? And after a while, college looked good. There's a time for all things. 
time to mourn. What is the time to mourn? I've told you in this class, when is the time to mourn? When is the time to feel bad? You can do it every day at a certain time. What is the time? When you go in your prayer closet, you don't live in your prayer closet. Jesus said, come out. So you can mourn every day when you go in your prayer closet. You can wallow in sadness and all kinds of bad thoughts in front of Jesus and cry and tell him how you feel. You're supposed to cast your care on him, students. Most people, people don't believe that. When I'm upset, I go and be upset to God. Why? He said to. Do you do that? Go in the prayer closet. Dear God, Dr. Brown makes me so upset. Will you straighten him out? If I were you, I would tell him. Get it out of your system. Don't tell your fellow students. Give me a bad rap. <laughs> That's breaking the second commandment. Do unto others you haven't done to you. Go tell God. He has a big stick. He can get me. If he wants to. Are you with me? When do you, when do you visit all your problems? Where does the Bible tell you to do that? In the prayer closet. I've been very upset. I've told God, you're trying to, uh, he called me to pastor. And I preached the truth the best I knew how, and some people walked in the light of it, and others totally ignored it. <coughs> well, I hadn't grown in my emotional understanding that I'm not Jesus and I'm not the chief shepherd. And I'm really not responsible for the flock. I was taking it so seriously. And I felt like a failure. I felt like it was a personal personal rejection. The people didn't walk in the truth. You, have, you understand how I could, I could feel that way? You say, well, that's stupid. Well, you try to be a, you try to be the leader. You try to be a pastor. And I went in before God and I said, God, you know, I'm really, this is upsetting me, and I feel badly for some of these people who are deliberately thumbing their nose at what I teach as God's Word and Dr. Brown's opinion. Disagree with him. And I said, God, I have studied Hebrew, I've studied Greek, I've researched this, I don't give a hoot one way or the other, but I have researched it until I know what you say, and they don't have the ability to do that, and Lord, they don't have the training I have, and they discount everything I say, and they wouldn't do that to their ophthalmologist, they wouldn't do that to their gynecologist, they wouldn't do that to their brain surgeon, but they do that to me, a specialist in scripture, and they don't even think twice about doing it. That really can upset you if you take yourself seriously. If you care about people. So I went in the prayer closet. I decided I better get it out of my system there than to take that frustration to the pulpit. I've seen evangelists and preachers take it to the pulpit. I've seen people carry anger around with them and bitterness you can see it on their face. Just wait till you get in your 30s or 40s. And you have anger and bitterness, it will make you look like you're in your 50s or 60s. Now why are you carrying anger around and venting it on people who don't deserve it? Because you don't know how else to cope with it. You follow what I'm saying? So I told God, God, I poured it out. I told him, if you don't care, I don't care. See, that's shocking to people. You talk to God that way. How else can I tell him how I feel except tell him how I feel? If you don't ever feel that way, then please don't say it. Say it only how you feel. I dumped it on God. You're going to be nice to him? And I'm going to be nice to him. You're not going to ostracize them? I'm not going to ostracize you. <coughs> and you keep giving them life and health and work and all 
all that is, and they're ignoring your word, and you don't seemingly care and judge them, well, I'm not going to break fellowship either. I'm going to be a jolly good fellow just like you. I never wrote the book. I'm not the judge. I never thought it up to start with. You, Boy, that's called getting it out of your system, isn't it? You say, God blasted you for daring to tell him how you feel. He already knew how I felt. He said, get it out of your system. Cast your care on me. And I never do cast care by saying, by talking in Elizabethan English, thou knowest, O God, how one shouldest. Is that how you vent your frustration? By switching into Elizabethan language? I don't. People have this weird idea you got to talk a certain way to God or you're sacrilegious. You have to talk a certain way about God or you're sacrilegious. But when you go into God's presence, he said, tell me what's on your mind. I'm upset. I'm frustrated. I'm sad. I'm confused. Whatever you are. And when you get it all out, then you feel better. And you can say, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. <laughs> Thanks for listening, God. I sure feel better. Check with you next time. Thanks for not doing to me what I want you to do to them. <laughs> right? Right? Once it's out of your system, you can think a little more coolly. But how many people do you know do what God says? Cast your care. So you can come out of the prayer closet and not be depressed and frustrated and discouraged. You can come out and say, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I will bless the Lord at all times. I will. Lord, what do you want me to learn in this situation with these goats I'm pastoring? <laughs> <laughs> I said that for my <laughs> How can this situation make me more Christ-like in my thoughts? Hi, sister so-and-so, you go, you. No, 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 no. You reprobate. No, 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 no. How can it make me more Christ-like? Jesus never was unkind to people, was he? Well, I'll tell you how I handle it. Somebody's too big of a pain, I just cut them off, I build a wall, I ignore them, and I don't have anything more to do with them. That's how some people cope. Can we be friends? No, you hurt me. Don't want to talk to you anymore. That's unchrist like. That's how lots of people do. Not talking about it. Pressed into the world's mold. Jesus never said to people, Come down off the cross. He didn't turn it. Not talking to you anymore. <laughs> Did he? He bows his head and he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Wow. I mean, talk about demonstration of grace. How are you treating people that you don't like, huh? The way Jesus does? It's very, very important, students. What can I be thankful in this situation? How come together? How can I show Christ to others in this situation? Right? But what Jesus think about and meditate on, say in this situation. What would Jesus do in this situation? And it's not, I know what I'd do if I was Jesus. <laughs> no, it's what would Jesus do? You're not Jesus. You're trying to shape up to become like him. What's three wrong presuppositions that cause the why me, why this, and why now, and I want to uh, understand at least what's going on. What are the three wrong presuppositions? Number one? Ownership. Ownership. It's my car, my wife, my children, my books, my clothes, my future, my, my, my. You're an owner. You're an owner. It's yours, God. You're trying to be a manager. As long as you're an owner, you're going to have different reactions than if you're a manager. Is that right? Mm -hmm. How many believe it's easy to be a manager? Mm -hmm. Not easy. 
We're all inherently owners. Secondly, is it right for you to come down with MS? Multiple sclerosis? Is that right? Is it right for you to get in an accident, car wreck, somebody else's fault, paralyze you? Is that right? You have rights not to have bad, those bad things happen to you. And if they do, you have a right to be angry, don't you? You have a right to be bitter, right? Because God isn't treating you right. Well, if you're into your rights, you will face bitterness and anger and unhappiness because your rights are going to be violated. See it all the time. Surrender your rights to God. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. What mind? Who did nothing through strife or vainglory. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. Let this mind be in you. The mind is in verses 3 and 4. Who esteemed others better than themselves. That's not American. I'm going to esteem you more highly than myself. <laughs> Watch out, dude. I'm going to run you over. You get in my way. I'm going to outplay you on the basketball court. I'm going to. I'm going to be. I'm going to out hit you. I'm going to out. I'm going to get better grades than you. We're very competitive, man. We are extremely competitive. Get out of my way! Where did that come from? You're hindering my right to progress as I want to progress. And I didn't want you there, and you didn't signal, and you broke the law. You just violated my right, and I'm going to get angry and send you signs or whatever. People do it all the time. Very easy to do, because the world teaches you to be that way. <clears throat> Surrender your rights, that's tough. You, it's not a one-time deal, students. You know why my feelings get hurt? It's the same reason your feelings get hurt. You know why your feelings get hurt? Because someone didn't treat you or do what you thought they should. That's why you get your feet. Right? Isn't that right? And so, you have certain expectations called your rights. That friends should be friendly and act like friends and not tell your secrets to other people. I mean, that is so rotten. For you to betray trust, you have violated my right to share information with who I want to share it with and not share it with others. And you were my good friend, and I shared with you, and you went and told your best <coughs> friend and swore everybody to secrecy, and they told their best friend. And pretty soon, everybody knows, and you're devastated. Why are you devastated? Haven't you learned? Haven't you learned anything from pirates? Dead men tell no tales. <laughs> you know what that means? You don't want your secrets told. Don't tell anybody doesn't mean go kill your friend. <laughs> it means don't tell anybody. It's not a secret anymore after you tell someone. It's not a secret anymore. Now two people have it, and you can't control what that other person does, no matter what they swear on a stack of Bibles. Because they'll get their friend to swear on a stack of Bibles, too. So, any of you have any social problems, friendship problems? I guarantee 
you, somebody didn't do what you thought they ought to do. <clears throat> Surrender your rights to God. Let Him fight your battles. But let me tell you this. Learn wisdom. and Don't get yourself into situations that people are going to run over you if all possible. You remember the last secret I told you and asked you never tell anybody? No. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I don't have the slightest worry you're going to ever tell anybody, do I? Do I? No. It's a choice. Made a deal with my wife before we got married. And there are some things. We don't talk. I don't talk with the guys, and you don't talk with the girls. She said, absolutely. I said, well, what are they? And we developed a list. And we agreed we would not talk these things. These things were private between she and I. And every once in a while, she checks. Did you tell anybody what I told you? You better be careful who you marry. Because rights are a huge thing. Some people don't like toothpaste specks on the mirror. Doesn't a person have a right to brush their teeth close to the mirror and get toothpaste? <laughs> And you don't like that? What right do you have not to like it? Well, you say, well, what right do they have? To oh, see, we're talking rights now. That's my point. <clears throat> Find a partner that is as much like you in as many areas as possible so you have agreement. Because in every area where you don't have agreement, Somebody's probably going to have an opinion. Is that right? And nobody thinks about this before they get married. Seriously. About daily being irritated. Because the other person does stuff to annoy you. Now you have several choices. Tell them or don't tell them. Stuff. The annoyance. Tell them. Tell them again. Nag them. All kinds of techniques are available to you. Is that right? <laughs> Do it back to them. Find out what annoys them and do it to them in their area and ask them how they like it. All kind, isn't that tit for tat? Are you a tit for tatter? Don't say anything. <laughs> you did it to me first. That's a tit for tatter. Isn't it? We all kind of grew up tit for tat, didn't we? You hit me first. <laughs> Mama! He's pulling my hair. Well, she elbowed me. See, tit for tat. It's that. Call, it's called that. What do we call? It? We call it sibling rivalry. What it's called is self right fighting. It's ungodly behavior that parents think is just normal. It's demonstration of self centeredness from these kids. And if you don't learn as a child, you will grow up and be an adult self-centered tit for tatter. <clears throat> and God have mercy if you marry somebody who is, to make life work and to be happy, they have to have things in order. They can't stand what they call messes. 
and you're a perpetual mess. Don't marry somebody who has to have you change your lifestyle to get along. And don't marry a guy who's a, well, that's what God made women for. <laughs> Pick up after me. Man, wait on me. That's a woman's job. You don't like it? Straighten it. There's lots of men that way. That's your job. I work hard. I go out there. You don't go out there and work and have to do what I do. I expect you to take care of the home. And if you're not happy with what I'm doing, I'm sorry. Get a life. Or, oh, I'm sorry, honey. Yeah, oh, I'll do my best. I, I won't do it. Yes, dear. Nothing changes. It's nicer to yes, dear. Oh, I'm so. Oh, I'll, I'll, I won't do that anymore. And they do. You promised me. I forgot. I'm sorry. Pray for me that I remember. And they don't. Welcome to marriage. <laughs> 101. Tell you what you do when you're irritated to make it all disappear, to feel much better, and to change the whole thing. It just say, come here, honey. Give me a hug and kiss. Let's smooch for a little while. Remember how it was so wonderful? Don't let these things bug you. Let's just kiss and make up and be happy. Isn't that cool? <laughs> There's another option for your toolbox. <coughs> Guaranteed to make everything fine. <coughs> Students, uh, you're going to have to work on this rights thing. And when you're irritated and upset, you better start seeing the little guy dancing with the red flag saying, your rights are being violated. What are your rights? You haven't surrendered to these guys. I did. I surrendered them all to God. They're all surrendered. <laughs> Don't talk to me about doing it again. It's not something you do forever. One time and for you got to regularly decide, are you an owner or a manager? Do you, are, do you have rights or responsibilities? I'm into my rights, not my responsibilities. How about you? But God says, be into your responsibilities and let me fight for your rights. Now, that doesn't mean you can't talk and ask for change. But after all your talk and all of your prayer and all of your whatever, and they don't change, what are you going to do? Call my mom, I should have listened. You told me not to marry them, and you were right. Don't do that. You made your bed, lie in it. Or get a divorce. And then you're in trouble with God. $495, I see the sign on the way home, the divorce. 495 Remember that. If you want me to bring the telephone number next time, that's the world solution, and that's the church, Christian church solution. Divorce. That's not God's solution. Divorce is all about my rights. I have a right not to be married to you any longer. I have a right to be happy. I don't have to put up with this. Right? Isn't that how, right, students? Isn't that how people talk? Why do they get divorced? It is, and it's all them. It's all the other person. It's never them. They're the victim of their other person. It's all about their rights are being violated. Students, and I want to tell you something. If you don't get serious about this, you're going to be very much just like the rest of the Christian world whose divorce rate is identical, to, if not higher, than the sinner world. God's grace really does super things for marriage, doesn't it? I mean, the Holy Spirit really helps people live victorious in a marriage life, right? Look at the divorce rates. The answer is, Holy Spirit does nothing for Christians in marriage. 
or evidently all these Christians aren't being Christian. Or we're all living in the la-la land where they live happily ever after. And you need to quit viewing life as a fairy tale, students. So when are you going to start learning these things, dealing with these things? Well, why not start now? God owes me an explanation for my problems. Let's switch gears and go to our study guide on the Romans, we, I mean, uh, the Psalms we were doing last time. By the way, you, you want to be wise? Do you remember the friends Wisdom had I put on the board? I don't expect you to remember the friends. I'll put it on the board again. I would like you to write it down, and when I ask you the third time, what are the friends of wisdom? It goes hand in hand. Wisdom always is has a group of friends. Wisdom is never alone. Never. Wisdom, here are wisdom friends. Understanding. Knowledge. Insight, discretion, somebody with insight says to you before you're about to do something, if I were you, I would do that. They're advising you to have discretion and don't do what you're going to do. Because the person with insight knows it's going to irritate and alienate. But you don't know that because you don't have the same insight. This is where we need friends who are wise. We need wise friends to keep us from doing foolish things. Discretion. Instruction. I'm trying to give you instruction on how to think about life. I'm trying to give you knowledge and understanding and insight. And hopefully you'll make your choices based upon these things and you'll have greater discretion in what you choose to do, how you choose to think, how you choose to act or not. Truth. Righteousness? Righteousness is measuring up to God's standard. Uprightness. That's uh, integrity. Your person of your word, uprightness. These are the friends. Wisdom. Wisdom in parallel. You're going to learn in just a moment about parallelism in Hebrew poetry and <coughs> the... Uh, it's a uh, genre, a way, just like uh, Mary had a little lamb, a little bread, a little jam. Hear the rhyme? Everywhere that Mary went, the sheep was sure to, was sure to go. You can make up rhymes. It's called rhyming. You could put that in the genre of poetry. It's not how one normally talks. So there, you're used in English to reading different genres. You're, you can be a fluent English speaker and pick up Milton, Paradise Lost, and get lost. Not be able to understand what he's doing because he's writing in epic poetry. And there's some people who love to compose poetry and love to read poetry, and most people don't. Why? There's some forms of language that are easier to understand than others, even though you know words. And there's some forms of expression that are very hard. Or sit and write, write a poem about what I talked about in this class today. 
write a narrative description of what I talked about. Yeah, you could do that. Dr. Brown talked about this, and then he said that, and he reviewed this, and then we quoted that. That's narrative. That's much easier, right? I'd make a sonnet. 21 lines. You'd have to study sonnets. What meter? Write what happened in class today in like a Shakespearean sonnet. That's called the genre. In the Bible, God doesn't keep everything in one style of writing. God likes variety. And so, when we come to Hebrew Psalms, there's poetry. Poetry, P-O-E-T-R-Y, Job, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, large portions of Isaiah, written in parallelism, not rhyme, not a sonnet, but rather you say something in this line and you have a parallel line that either says the same thing differently or illustrates with a metaphor and then says, the, the Lord is my shepherd metaphor, line one. You think about a shepherd, what does a shepherd do? I shall not want. Want means, this Elizabethan word meaning lack or do without. I shall not lack, do without, because why? That's Hebrew parallelism. It's show, it giving me a picture of a shepherd and then saying, since God is my shepherd, I'm secure. Uh, there's a poetry that says, give unto the, glory, the Lord the glory to his name. Next line. Give unto the Lord... All ye angels, the glory do his name. 